19 anymore. <laughs> That was 1978. Can you believe that? Yeah. Elvis Costello. Everybody breathe for me, please. <laughs> One more time. So much better. I am Reverend Phil Tapp. I am your assistant minister here at Woo! Centers for Spiritual Living Parker. <laughs> I'm so grateful to be before you this morning, helping to offer up our teen service. I want to recognize our senior minister here, our beloved Reverend Rick McCollum. <laughs> and being as this is a wonderful joint service, how, about, how many people from New Dawn do we have out there? Yeah. Oh, wow. I would like to recognize your senior minister, Reverend Jennifer Watt. We have some important people here as well. If you're here for the very first time, if this is your first time to a center for spiritual living, not to this center, because we don't want to give away like 500 gift packs. <laughs> but if this is your first time to the center, our ushers have a, a gift packet for you, an informational packet and a rose or a flower, and they will be back here at the back. They're not gonna hand them out right now, but they'll be back there at the back after the service for you. I want you to know that for those of you who are brand new, that when I first came here, it was like coming home. It was like coming home. I finally found my people, and I am so grateful that that is the case. So welcome home. We've been waiting for you. <clears throat> so before we get to the teen service, which the, this delightful group of people have put so much effort into this, I'm so excited for you to be able to see how this goes. <clears throat> we do have a little bit more stuff of some, for some, from some adults. So that being said, you will be seeing from Heather Lonergan, who is the youth coordinator here. <clears throat> and I will now hand the mic off to our practitioner in service today, who also happens to double as the consciousness for the youth program. This is Katie MacArthur. Let us pray. Breathing in the peace, the love, and the joy. That is God. There is one power, one presence, and it fills all the spaces, all the spaces in between, in and through. That is God. We are connected. As there is no space that God is not, we too are the life of God. We are the peace. We are the love. We are the joy. as we are all connected to the one, the one ultimate source. Today is perfect. Today, the service is perfect. There is no need for pain, worry. It is all laid out before us through the law. I am so grateful for this knowing, and I release my word knowing it is so, and so it is. So it is. <laughs> Heather Lonergan. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I lost track of my voice. Good morning. Um, Good morning. <laughs> welcome, everyone. Um, I wanted to just take a moment and um, kind of tell you a bit about my journey and my family's journey here. I joined CSL Parker about seven years ago, 
and my kids were much smaller than me. Um, I was seeking a spiritual community, and I wanted a community for my kids to grow up in. And as Phil said a moment ago, it was like coming home. Um, the, th the thoughts, the beliefs that I'd had, all of a sudden I was hearing things repeated back to me, and it was like a miracle. Um, so for those of you who have been on that same journey, I know you felt that same way. Um, and so, you know, as my family has been invited in, as my kids have been invited in to this journey along with me, um, one of the things that I've done is to try to honor their path. That's one of our principles here, right, is that we honor all paths. And so I've let them kind of participate and join or not as they chose. And um, that journey has been different for each of them. Um, but my daughter Mia, who's part of the teen service today, um, began participating in our preteen group um, about six years ago. And she's just progressed through um, the preteen group to the teen group, and that's where she's been during her time in high school. Um, and I've also had the privilege of um, helping to teach both of those groups of kids, the preteen group and now the teen group is who I work with. And I have seen these kids grow, develop, and connect in some amazing ways. Um, I've watched them come together as, as their own community within the larger community that is CSL Parker. And I want you guys to each take a moment to think about um, if you didn't grow up with the spiritual path. Some of you may have, but I know a lot of us didn't. So take a moment and think about your own journey that brought you here today to CSL Parker. Think for a moment what it would have meant to you to be on this spiritual path and be part of a community like this as a teenager. What kind of a difference would it have made in your life? How might your life have progressed differently? Um, we're all on our perfect path, but these kids have, are, you know, I think they've just gotten um, an extra special privilege of being part of this community from such a young age. Um, one of the things that I wanted for my kids was to have them be grounded in a community and a belief system that I know will be there for them wherever they go, whatever they do, it's always there for them, and it will guide them through whatever challenges they may face. Um, and I, I think that's something really incredibly special. Last year, um, our teens began um, connecting more with the teens at Mile High, um, and that's thanks to Reverend Phil. So he started taking them on overnights up with the Mile High kids and some of the other kids from the area, including, I know, some of the kids that are here today from New Dawn. Um, they also attended the Rocky Mountain Region Winter Camp, which is down in the Monument area. And the connection and the sense of community that they experienced at those large, in those larger group settings was phenomenal. And because of those local um, overnights in the winter camp, they were determined last year to go to summer camp in California, um, which is a long way away. <laughs> um, it requires a flight, and it's, it's not an inexpensive trip. And because of their hard work and our community's generosity, they were able to go last year. Um, and it was truly transformative. And because of that experience, they went to winter camp again, and now they're hoping to go to summer camp again this year. And that's part of the reason for our service today. Um, so we're really hoping to send them. Our offering later today is going to be part of their journey this summer. So today, um, they are bringing you some of what they have gleaned from the most recent winter camp, which was this past January, again, the Rocky Mountain Region Winter Camp. Um, the focus of that camp centered a lot around self-care. And we know what a priority that is for us as adults. We hear it talked about all the time, and a lot of us try to practice it. But it's just as important, if not more important, for our teens. Um, if you have a teenager in your life, you know some of the stresses that they are experiencing. They are juggling um, often very demanding school schedules, sports, clubs, other after-school activities, jobs, um, the high cost of college, <laughs> trying to figure that out. Um, and what feels like an increasingly dangerous world that they're going to inherit. Um, problems like school violence and climate change weigh very heavily on their minds. We talk about it um, in our team group sessions. So our theme for this month is a very timely one. Our theme is honoring the divine feminine in all. And to me what that means is nurturing yourself and nurturing those around you, really keeping your connections close and using that network of connections when you have challenges, when you have problems. 
things, but also nurturing yourself, caring for yourself um, at the most deep spiritual level that you can, showing up with compassion for yourself and others when it's needed most. So you're going to hear today how each of them took that concept and that message into their own hearts, and each of them has honored it in their own specific and very unique way, and I know you're going to be touched by what each of them has to bring you. So before we begin, I'd like to introduce them. So I'm going to have you guys stand up and just turn around. Um, and I'm going to actually have each of them introduce themselves. Uh, hi, my name's Mia. This is my mom. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Andrew. This is my mom. <laughs> and majesty of the divine is a life we are living. We see it, sense it, and feel it at the core of our being. So, this day we simply pause and access the quantum field of infinite possibilities. We consciously release any old beliefs, patterns, and behaviors that do not support the truth of our being. We release fears, doubts, and concerns that move us into states of discord. This day, we claim and proclaim that love is the answer to all questions. We claim and proclaim that eternal peace passes all human understanding. We claim and proclaim that eternal life is infused in every thought, every circumstance, and every situation. This is the perfect day to stand for love for all, to stand for peace for all, and to stand for harmony. Every moment is a reminder of grace in action. Every moment affords us the opportunity to praise the divine. From this place, I give thanks. Gratitude floods my being as this day unfolds. It is from this space that I release this word into the precious law of the divine. How good to just let go and trust the flow of the infinite. In the let go, we claim that this day is blessed and a blessing. <coughs> We know this to be true, and we revel in the outpouring of miraculous unfoldings. And we all say together, and so it is. <coughs>
each. So, as humans unfold in their mentality, the law automatically reacts to them. We can demonstrate a level of our ability to know. Beyond this, we cannot go. But we will constantly expand and increase in knowledge and understanding, thereby continuously growing in our ability to make use of the law. In time, we shall be made free through it. The students should take time every day to see their life as they wish it to be, to make a mental picture of their ideal. They should pass this picture over to the law and go without their business, with a calm assurance that on the inner side of life, something is taking place. There should not be any sense of hurry or worry about this, just a calm, peaceful sense of reality. Let the law work through and express itself in the experience. There should be no idea of compulsion. We do not have to make the law work, it's nature to work. In glad news, we should make known our desire and confidence. We should wait upon the perfect law to manifest through life. reading a speech to you all. Our part is to be ready and willing to be guided into truth and liberty. If as a part in the, of the process of meditation, it becomes ne necessary to change our mode of living, then the law will point the way and we will follow. Our correct choice will be a part of the working of the law. All doubt and fear must go, and in place must come the confidence and faith, for we shall be led by the Spirit into all good. People often say, I don't know what to do, and I don't know how to make a choice. We must realize, though, that there is an intelligence within us that does know. This guidance is just as true in India, where people are Buddhist, as it is in America, where people are Christians. It was just as true 10,000 years ago, before the advent of Christianity, as it will be 10,000 10, years hence. Thank you. While we wait for Olivia to come to the stage, let us all participate in the Jeopardy theme. I'm here. Well done. Yeah. 
guys. My name is Mia. Um, I'm going to do something a little different today. I'm going to tell a story. So, change. It's inevitable. There are things that happen in life that change who we are, the people around us, the society we live in, and how we perceive the world. Change is powerful. I'm going to tell you a story about a girl named Janie. In middle school, Janie and I were best friends. We did everything together. She was the type of person who always knew how to make me laugh. The kind of person who bakes you a plate of cookies after an argument. Oh, sorry, jeez. <laughs> um, she was the kind of person who was always up for an adventure. The kind of person who doesn't take life too seriously. The kind of person who was hard to come by. I share unforgettable memories with her. Stories I will cherish forever. But at the end of eighth grade, we were riding the bus home together. She turned to me and said, there's something I need to tell you. Jeez, I did not expect to cry. <laughs> um, I watched as a tear rolled down her face. Time stopped. My heart dropped as I heard the words, I'm moving away, come out of her mouth. I had grown up with Janie. She was like a sister to me. She was part of who I am. Summer went by and she moved away. We were both starting high school this year, only this time we were doing it miles away from each other. We both kept in touch, and sometimes we would visit one another, but it wasn't the same. I've always wondered what my life would have been like if Janie hadn't moved. I've had a bittersweet relationship with change these past four years. Change can't be good. Major changes in my life, like Janie moving away or other deaths of my loved ones, have brought me pain. But I've realized that even though these moments were painful, they were in a way blessings in disguise. I'm sure you are all familiar with, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure you are all familiar with the yin and yang. This symbol holds its roots in Taoism, a Chinese religion and philosophy. The yin is a dark swirl that intertwines itself with a light swirl, yang. Each have a small dot of the opposite color within themselves. It is this concept of dualism, the idea that everything is interconnected. Going through high school without the person who I thought would always be right by my side wasn't easy. I struggled to find myself. I had other friends who stayed by my side, and I had friends who left.
Currently, we FaceTime each other as often as we can. We're still best friends, and we tell each other everything that's happened in our lives. She has started college, and I'm going off to college next year. Another big change that will affect not only me, but my family and friends as well. So here's what I have learned. We cannot change what happened in the past, but we can change how we relate to it. Think about that for a second. Thank you. as I can because I wrote this last night. So, um, I mean, I was thinking about it for weeks before, but, um, so when we first started talking about the divine feminine, I thought it was like in some way really sexist. Um, so, like we talked about it in teen group on Sunday and I started to realize like, no, this is not one of those things. This is a God qualities that occur more in women than in men. So for me, what comes to mind is like nurturing, intuition, empathy, creation, sensuality, just to name a few. But um, other than that, I just think of a mother, you know, um, the ultimate caregiver. So um, at winter camp, I started to understand that caring for anyone or anything kind of starts with caring for you. Um, I mean, so when you get on an airplane, this is like the best example I can think of, uh, they tell you that if you need an oxygen mask for any reason, to put it on yourself first, and then to help the children and the elderly or the differently abled people all around you, because you can't help anyone if you're suffocating, because that just doesn't work. Um, so, this kind of reminded me of that camp when we did this exercise with, we, we all got um, cards that went ace to king. And on the ace, we had to write our, our name. And on all the other cards, we had to write people or things that we really cared about. And then after, we had to put them in order of how important they were to us. And we all soon like came to understand that none of us were at the top of that list. You know, none of us put ourselves above all these other people and things in our lives. But how are you gonna help someone else if you're suffocating? So um, we all kind of made a pact to um, move our aces higher. And the best way to do that is through self-care. So in the past couple weeks, that's actually came up for me in like really odd ways. Um, I never thought that self-care was gonna be, you know, something like forgiveness. But it actually came up when I was dealing with some troubles in my family. And I was holding grudges. And, you know, holding in a lot of anger and angst and, you know, really just hurting myself and holding that grudge. And I actually called my dad because he's, you know, my, my therapist, I guess, in a way. <laughs> and he told me, what is that doing for you? What is holding that grudge? What is, how does that serve you? And in my head, I was like, well, it means I win, you know? <laughs> but <laughs> I guess um, I really started to think about the only person that holding this grudge is hurting is me. And so I put on my big girl panties, you know? <laughs> I, um, and, you know, even though this person didn't directly say to me, I'm really sorry, and I was still really hurt, um, what self-care looked like to me was saying, I forgive them anyway. And I didn't need to hear it. I needed to know it, and I just needed to know it. And so self-care always comes in different ways. For me, it just came in, you know, forgiving someone. And, you know, for some people it looks like taking a bath or like making yourself some mac and cheese or, you know, just taking a shower. But, um, 
you know, just make sure you're always trying to move your ace higher up in your deck. But 
It is something that I've imagined doing for a while. I've been coming to this center for about five years now, and I wanted to change it up. So now that I have your attention, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I don't do notes. I don't do written talks. Uh, I just get up here and speak, because that's what works for me. When, when I heard that this month's theme was going to be divine femininity, um, I almost had a problem with it. And not just with femininity, but with the idea of masculinity and femininity, femininity and what those represent, um, the duality. I, it was difficult for me to grasp those two concepts. Um, and, and this talk almost didn't happen because I was scared to talk about it. But I figured that maybe there's other people that think the same way as me. I don't feel masculine or feminine. Hardly. Yeah. I, it's never really been a thing for me. Um, what I, I see in that, and what we've talked about in our team group, is the idea of what femininity and masculinity represent. Um, talking about femininity and divine femininity come from, coming from the heart of being intuition, and divine masculinity coming from the head, and that is instinct. Um, and that bothered me a little bit. Because those are just, to me, behaviors that we have assigned because they show up in people with certain genitalia. Uh, and that's strange to me. The best way I found to explain this is art. Art. I want you to take a moment and think of a piece of art, whether it's a painting or a production or a piece of music, whether it be performed on the stage or not. <laughs> not that duality in art. That expression that we give of our perception of the world put into art using the many different tools, colors, sounds, um, movements, there's not ever really a duality in that. And I find that interesting. Just like how intuition and how instinct are pieces of us. Brush strokes, music notes, chords, movements are pieces of art. They're just pieces of us. A spectrum of different pieces and skills that we can learn, <laughs> learn, um, and, and take upon ourselves. But there's not a duality there. Um, Veronica talked about how in the beginning of talking about this theme, she thought it was sexist. And she changed her mind. And I'm glad that you took time to think about that. I still stand with that. I. I still stand with that, that it not necessarily is sexist, but the idea of enforcing femininity, femininity, I'm having so much trouble with that word, <laughs> and masculinity as certain stereotypes. That's not necessarily how people work. 
biologically our behaviors are influenced um, by our internal chemistry, which a lot, ha a lot of that has to do with which gender we are. But this vessel, this physical vessel, this body that we have, is only serving as the toolbox to transcend ourselves. And I feel like, in a way, boxing ourselves into masculinity and femininity and putting those labels on things instead of just using the large spectrum of different skills, of different God qualities. Thank you, Veronica. It's almost a disservice to how we can transcend ourselves. I wanted to talk about art. Um, and going back to that piece of art that I had you imagine, do you realize how incredible that is for that to even exist? The, the fact that out of the infinite, virtually infinite amount of possibilities that that exact piece of art could exist is incredible. And that applies the same to us. Because just like how art is an expression of us, we are an expression of the universe. We are an expression of God, or spirit. And so, why should we try to assign dualities to ourselves when we can have all the, the, the whole toolbox, the whole toolbox, all of the God qualities, attempting to be as well-rounded human beings as we can. There's a reason that my generation, Gen Z, the Zoomers, um, have been more accepting of gender fluidity. It's the point that that's not necessarily necessary to assign yourself to anything specific. You can be whatever you want because it's not what's on the outside, it's what's on the inside. Camp, winter camp, summer camp is where people like this, whether you agree with me or not, are beginning to think are beginning to challenge ideas much like I'm challenging the theme today. And that is so important to me, to our future. These people are just a fraction of the people you'll see at summer camp. I believe we had 300 kids there yeah. in California. These kids today, <laughs> my friends, my peers, these are the future. They go to camp and they learn. This is a learning resource. This is not telling people what to believe. It's making you think. That's what I get out of this. That's what many people get out of this. Learning is a spiritual resource. And so once we have more people involved and beginning to question things and, and challenge what might be normal, do you think that might get us somewhere? Yes. We might make some progress? Yes. These teens are our future. And I am so proud to be a part of that. I'm so proud. <laughs> So I want everyone to come away with this, to come away from this service today thinking, really thinking about things, reconsidering things, challenging the norm, challenge yourself to be well-rounded, to use the entire toolbox and to not limit yourself.
I would like to invite you all into a meditation to close this talk. Think. Take a minute and think. Thank you. I love myself so much. 